about radical change for sustainability. So basically, it's the pink area you see in this matrix. Here you have two dimensions. On the one, you have concern for human development, and on the other one, for ecological integrity. And you have different approaches which are uh, positioned on this matrix. Over here, you would have McDonald's, basically. Uh, so, uh, okay, here I put neoliberalism, not McDonald's, but just to, to, to understand, right? With very low degree of, of, uh, of concern for ecological integrity, not really much for a holistic human development, while on the other side, you have ecofeminism, indigenous movements, and so on and so forth. So approaches which are uh, both about taking care about uh, people and their vulnerabilities, as well as about an ecological protection of the environment. And right here in the middle, you have the era of so-called incremental change, where you have mainstream environmental movements and also other different uh, approaches. I have put also, a few, I, I guess I, I understand that most of you are in Chinese studies, right? So I also put some uh, Chinese approaches to development. Zhong Wumang, Xiao Kan Shi Hui, Min Shen Zhui, as well as Shen Tai Wenmin, which is very close to eco-authoritarianism, according to some observers, right? So this is just to show you the way I look at transformation. Transformation for me is a radical change towards strong sustainability, okay? So what I, we're going to go back to this matrix at the end of this presentation, but I just wanted to state to make this clear right away. So what I'm going to do um, today is to share with you my journey towards a transformative research approach for the Belt and Road Initiative. And the presentation is divided in four different sections. The first one is about uh, why I decided to, to engage with this topic in the way uh, I have done. And I will share with you both my um, exogenous motivations from my societal and working environment as well as more intimate motivations, let's say. Um, I will then move to the conceptual frames which help me in guiding me in this journey the tools we have employed in Venice in specific activities, and also um, our, um, let's say, um, latest research developments in Venice, and also what we are planning for the, for the near future, the next two years to three years, in terms of research and teaching activities. So let's start from the first one. Why I have engaged with this topic, with the Belt and Road Initiative, the way, uh, the way I have. Um, well, of course, there is a, uh, a lot of talk on the Battle Road Initiative, so I'm not going to be long on this. I think most of you are familiar with this. It is just huge. It is a huge uh, project with, uh, based on uh, infrastructural investments and the building of these economic belts across Eurasia and also Eastern Africa, increasingly so. Um, so, of course, there is a lot of discussion, especially in the community of era studies and Chinese studies, uh, where I belong, basically. The, guy, the dominant framing of this initiative is about growth and the way through which growth, material growth and cooperation can be strengthened across Eurasia and in some part of Africa as well. Through different instruments, uh, there are investments, especially in the, in the field of infrastructures, uh, energy, communications, logistics, uh, closer economic cooperation as well as harmonization of rules. Um, an increasingly large amount of observers see um, the Belt and Road as a fourth stage of globalization. So the first one was about Portugal, basically. The second one was led by Britain, the US, and then comes the first stage, the fourth wave, if you wish, of globalization, in this case led by China. Um, people who have this kind of, 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 of uh, let's say, approach to the study um, also shared this uh, basic idea that the uh, Belt and Road is basically a manifestation of an historical trend which has been there for quite a while, meaning that the body center of economic growth in the world is moving, right? It has, it has been moving from Asia towards Europe and the Atlantic after the Industrial Revolution, and this is the blue line you see there, and then uh, until the end of the Second World War, and then as a result of the emergence of different powers, economic powers in Asia, is sort of moving back. So you can see the Belt and Road also in this perspective, and this is one of the reasons why there is a lot of talk about this. In all of this, there has been an increasingly polarized debate about the Belt and Road Initiative, especially within Europe. So on the one hand, you have uh, 
critics who are making very strongly the point of political risks, also within Europe, about this, uh, what has been called authoritarian advance, meaning the political model of China being able to influence also European institutions. The other uh, voices in the debate, the other, uh, let's say, part of the debate is dominated by those who see uh, potential for economic benefit. Also in terms of infrastructural investment. Um, this is also a very, a very uh, let's say, vital and very vibrant debate within Europe, especially in Mediterranean Europe and, and in the Balkans. Venice has been one of the core locus where this debate uh, has been unfolding in the last, I would say, four years. Of course, there are historical reasons. When you talk about Silk Road, some better note initiative in Venice, um, you know, uh, there is this very strong historical legacy um, of Venice as being one of the big powers facilitating contact between uh, East and West. But there is uh, another dimension which perhaps is more important to it, and which is the development of logistics in Venice, the port, the logistical, uh, the logistical uh, platform in Venice, uh, um, as well as the reframing of the industrial production in Venice, which was a lot about chemicals and now is, is moving towards logistics and also tourism, of course, which was also discussed in, in many meetings. So uh, one of the reasons why there has been a lot of debate, also in my community in Venice, about this, it is about the interest of very uh, important stakeholders who are trying to push for investments and so on and so forth. And on the other hand, you have people who are warning in Venice against this idea of an excessive push towards modernization. Venice and, and her history has been dominated since the, since the Industrial Revolution by this struggle uh, with coping with modernization um, and the, you know, the difficulties this kind of city has to find space in a world which is dominated by, by technology basically and also by anthropogenic impacts on the environment to which Venice and its people are very vulnerable. Uh, right now, there is the, um, Venice is, is living through a very a huge crisis. Uh, tonight we had the second highest tide of recording in history. Uh, this is a, a picture from, this, uh, from the early hours of, of uh, this morning, uh, with boats who are basically in the city, because the tide was so high that the boats uh, came into the city. Um, so when you talk about this uh, push towards modernization and towards material growth and stuff, of course in Venice we are also very much aware of the long-term consequences of the development patterns we have been, uh, which have been unfolding in the last couple of centuries. It is not just the case of this night, of course, it is uh, a trend which is very robust. These are the frequency of high tides, very high tides in the last century in Venice. So you see that climate change, for example, in Venice is something which is very tangible and you can actually experience, and you see the trend, right, of very high tides, which has been growing a lot, and it's very consistent, this tendency. So as an area studies scholar based in Venice, and dealing with China and sustainability, mostly, uh, what I came to realize uh, as my main motivation to engage with the Belt and Road Initiative was that I see in this uh, a window of opportunity to reflect on, on big civilizational challenges. And I realized that I was interested in this rather than in just joining the chorus of those who are pro Belt and Road Initiative or anti Belt and Road Initiative. I'm not at all interested in this, let's say, dichotomy. And uh, I wanted to overcome that and to look at something which was more meaningful to myself as well as to the community I work with, including both my colleagues. Uh, the society in which I live, and students, of course. So to understand the way, uh, to share with you the way I understand civilization and civilizational challenges, I have to move on to the second part of my presentation, which are the conceptual frames who are guiding, let's say, my journey. So when I uh, try to frame the idea of civilization, I wanted to apply, let's say, my side of the Belt and Road, um, um, I came to the idea that civilization is shaped and constrained by socio-ecological relations. And these relations are always contextual, culturally, historically, in time, and are also very much about places. Of course, I didn't come, come out with this idea myself, 
Uh, this is coming out from uh, the scholarship of people um, who try to reconfigure area studies and their relevance for society and, and science in the last couple of decades. Uh, one of them is Wolf Schaffer, and that paper you see there is, uh, I found that very important. Uh, Deepesh Chakrabarti also is, is an historian, is, is very important in trying to frame uh, this understanding of civilization as a contextual social ecological process. This is very conceptual, uh, but there was also some other, uh, let's say, intellectual frames which I employed, and which are more related to my, uh, I would say, emotional side. And I could, I realized that when I was taking part in a writing retreat, actually here in Finland, in Saitseminen National Park, is not far from Tampere. And I was there with a, a colleague of mine who had organized this writing retreat, and when I came across the work of a social philosopher, Elena Pulcini, who wrote this, uh, for me, very important book, which is also one of my, let's say, intellectual guides in my engagement with the Belt and Road. Um, and here, I, I, by reading this book, I realized that much of my engagement with the Belt and Road was about anxiety. I was very anxious uh, and very, to some, to some extent, I was also afraid about the impacts that these huge projects, infrastructural projects, may have on things I value most, which is nature, uh, beauty, uh, cultural difference, and so on and so forth. And this uh, dimension of care is also something which is very important and increasingly important in the sustainability debate I was involved with, as uh, Julie also mentioned at the beginning of this presentation. Um, the notion of, of care has been revitalizing to some extent and moved to more radical stances, the debate of sustainability, and actually something which is very much debated, especially in Nordic countries, but not only in Nordic countries, I mean, this is just a talk which is going to be given by a former colleague of mine uh, in a couple of weeks here in Helsinki at the Design Museum. Just to make you understand that this is very much debated, the role of care and caring attitudes in sustainability. Once I realized this thing about my anxiety, fear, of course, I could not make without Ulrich Beck and the idea of risk society, which I think most of you are familiar. And this idea about um, how we can face challenges as a global citizens, in a way. So this idea of community of faith, which is very much important in the rhetoric about the Belt and Road, is something you can find framed properly on an intellectual point of view in Ulrich Beck. And it resonates a lot also, uh, on, um, also with the debates on, uh, on the environment, of course, and anthropogenic modification of the environment. The last work which was very influential to me in framing uh, my approach to the study of Belt and Road was uh, the work of another philosopher, uh, Catherine Diamore, and this book in particular, uh, Great Tide Rising. This is a great book about the climate crisis mostly, but the, uh, the most important message I took from this book um, was that it is extremely important for scholars especially to try to align ethical stances with knowledge. Because when you align uh, those, those two things empower you to make actually a change also as a scholar and change institutions. So to sum up, because I see that now you are a little bit lost by all these, these different things, what I tried to do when I was approaching, uh, uh, when I was approaching this transformative uh, study of the Belt and Road was to try to take into account these three dimensions. So one was the cognitive reflection about my role as area studies scholars, the way area studies scholars can understand civilization linked to social ecological aspects as well, to try to frame properly in a useful way, my emotions about the Belt and Road, which was anxiety, and I had to frame this in a way which I could be shared with others, and then finding a source for ethical commitment. Once I was able to put these three things together in my mind and to share with others, then I say, well, now the next step is to try to, uh, to, try to find a way to uh, transform institutions, well, to study from a transformative perspective, institutions dominated the Belt and Road Initiative and to find space for changing them a little bit. Here's the moment um, um, where I entered the ideas. Well, I had already used it, but you know, I, I started to understand <coughs> institutions not only as values, norms, and rules, 
but actually as, as fields which are constructed socially against a specific issue, in this case might be the Belt and Road Initiative, at different scales. So you may talk about institutions of the Belt and Road Initiative in uh, uh, Mediterranean Europe, or you may talk about that in general. So you, you can have different scales. But what is very important is to understand that when you approach a study of institutional fields, um, you can understand them as um, arenas of debate, which are very dynamic in which values, norms, and rules are shaped constantly by the agency of actors. Um, there are tons of research uh, being done about this and a lot of different approaches you can take to deal with this dynamism of institutions based on the idea of fields. The one I found most important, most useful for me, and actually this was an idea of a um, friend, a colleague of mine, uh, who was a sociologist, <coughs> it was a strategic action field theory, which puts together two strains of knowledge and of research. One is organizational theory and the other, and the other is, is the theory of social movements. And it provides um, you know, a sort of useful account of how different coalitions can be created and can frame uh, in uh, different ways the fields. By employing this approach, it is also um, very difficult to, for me at least, to keep separated my identity as a scholar and the one of institutional entrepreneur. So my willingness, uh, in a way, to change the institutions which rule, govern, in this case, the Belt and Road Initiative. But I'm going to go back on this in a while. This meant to um, reframe both our knowledge, well, basically our knowledge about the Belt and Road Initiative from something which was basically about this shared purpose of material growth to basically this, right? So understanding the Belt and Road Initiative, its potential and its transformative potential in terms of sustainability. So this is what we started to do once we, uh, was this, once this path, this part of the journey was ended. To do, need, to do this, you need specific tools. And I will just describe them uh, based on, on two different things. So you, tools, well, it's, it's uh, more than tools, I would say practices, which can enable this mind shift. <coughs> you need people, of course, and, uh, but you need also methods. So how to generate this mind shift in the way you look at the Baton Road Initiative. Um, I will start with, uh, with the second part, so with the methods. The method we, we use, uh, we employed, um, also based on the experience of other uh, colleagues, um, has been Theory U. I don't know if some of you are familiar with this or have used already, or just know by name. No? All right. So, uh, well, Theory U is, is actually, was actually uh, born in the field of management studies. And the way we use this, um, rather than as a theory in itself, is uh, as a collaborative framework which instead of just going from problem to solution, uh, so based on past patterns in a linear way, the way you do like this, it sort of allow you and the people you work with to go, um, to go deeper, to unearth values, and to use those values and value judgments also um, to frame different solutions to a similar problem. Uh, this is important because it facilitates change, sometimes unearthing values and also emotions can be very useful to generate change. It is also very useful when you do research about sustainability related issue um, because this idea of unearthing values as a leverage point for systemic change, for change, for sustainability, is something that is increasingly important also in the sustainability debate. When you look at Greta, for example, uh, and the Fridays for Future movement, that is an, a way in which you know, uh, a lot of values and also desires are, let's say, put into question, right? Of the <coughs> generate change. So this is the path and, and the, the method we use, and then you will see a couple of examples of this. Very often, uh, this, um, uh, this uh, theory U approach is used also, um, is employed also 
with art-based methods. So methods which can um, change the way we uh, approach uh, problems. Also on this you will see a few examples that we have used in a recent retreat. As for the people uh, we try to engage in this endeavor, um, well, there are quite a few of them and you will see them uh, in a while, but we, we try to um, engage both practitioners and, and scholars which were responsive also ethically to the challenges which were raised by the Belt and Road Initiative in socio-ecological terms. So they, they also they are all people who are very much committed to, to sustainability, uh, that ready to embrace a little bit of normativity. So this idea of transformative change for sustainability, so to abandon this prejudice of objectivity in the work they do. Uh, and also open to reconstruct uh, the way they do research uh, about the Belt and Road Initiative. And also the topic they deal with. Of course, you, you don't need only people and methods, you need also money and, uh, and resources and, and the ideas of you know, the future in the institution, in the organization you are working with. Uh, this idea and, and resources and, and also um, possibility to, to organize things was, was given uh, to myself and my colleagues by the establishment of the Marco Polo Center, which Julie was mentioning at the beginning of this presentation which was established in, in 2018 based on, on uh, um, funding from the Ministry of Education and Research of Italy, uh, based basically on the performance of our department, which was rated uh, amongst the two or three best in Italy for area studies, and so we got this project, basically. Um, and different activities uh, funded by this center uh, were employing this approach I was talking to you about and I will further show in a while. The first activity we organized, the first big activity we organized was a summer school, um, which, was, um, which, was, which we um, organized in September, so a couple of months ago, uh, in, this, in this small island in the, in the Venetian Lagoon, and which was titled Uncovering Pathways of Change along the Belt and Road Initiative. We engage uh, around 20, 20, 24, if I'm not mistaken, mostly PhD students from, from all over the world, um, discussing, focusing on, uh, yeah, on four different dimensions, political economy, environmental sustainability, science and technology, and citizenship and participation. And we employed Theory U as a, as a method. So uh, there was um, a lot of interactive activities allowing students to reframe <coughs> knowledge they had got through the uh, summer school in different ways. The objective was to establish a community which was um, not only uh, committed to, to the study of the Belt and Road Initiative, well, not only giving them instruments to the study of Belt and Road Initiative, but also trying to strengthen in them uh, the commitment to do uh, uh, research which was um, ethically grounded. And it was um, pretty successful. Uh, the example was successful. These are a few of the learning journey, learning journeys, uh, things they had to prepare at the end of the well. Each day, the students had to to do some at the end of the day to explain how they felt about the process. It was so um, successful that not only students learned different uh, approaches, but also they tried to um, project different scenarios of change of the Belt and Road Initiative to the point that some, uh, some of the students were even proposing to use the um, digital infrastructure built through the Belt and Road Initiative to hijack the entire process and to make people aware of the environmental issues of the world. So stuff like that, basically. So some of them went to really to the, uh, to the radical side of the debate. Um, but what was most important for us was that through this process, and this is coming from the questionnaire we did at the end of the school, we really empowered them to look at the Belt and Road Initiative from a perspective different from the one they've been trained on in their home institutions. In an environment, and this is also taken from the questionnaire, uh, we, we, uh, we, uh, we, uh, we, we administered to them, which was very much open to collaboration Understand instead of competition and egocentrism, which is something you very often see in this kind of, of schools and also workshops and, and, 
and situation in university. So this is, was the take away, take home message of one of our students in the summer school. So it was very inclusive, very collaborative, very important to us to test the theory U approach um, and the way it could be done properly. Also, it provided us with a very detailed input on the social ecological impacts on the Belt and Road Initiative. Because a few of the lecturers, especially Fernando Asensau, you, you see here, uh, and another one, Eugenie Simonov uh, from Russia, um, are among the leading experts on the impact of the Belt and Road Initiative in, uh, on the social eco ecology across Eurasia and also some part, uh, some part of, uh, of Africa, especially Eastern Africa. So we were able also through their uh, participation in the summer school to get, uh, as researchers as well as organizers, uh, very detailed, accurate and up-to-date uh, information of what is going on. And it's about the general uh, approach uh, of the, of the uh, Belt and Road uh, Initiative, which is very much characterized by a pro-development bias um, and a technocratic stance uh, towards sustainability problems and pretty much as uh, business as usual in terms of the way we look at sustainability. About the impacts, uh, a lot of them were raised uh, during the summer school, in huge impacts on, the, on physical space because of the constructions, uh, impacts on biodiversity, biodiversity and also cultural diversity, especially in terms of relationship with places, and on environmental quality. So at this point, we were ready to take our endeavor to the next step. Because we knew that the theory U was working, was able to uh, engage people in, uh, in, uh, in this kind of reflection. And we also have a very strong, um, let's say, um, you know, very accurate information about socio-ecological relationship within the Baton Road. So we were basically ready to, to go to the forest. And this is the last part of our journey. Um, we organized a um, study retreat with a team of people in the, in the forest of Consiglio in the Alps, in, in my own town, basically. It's, it's 80 kilometers north of Venice. Um, two, three days, uh, together with these people you see here. So, um, from left uh, to right, there is Mark Foggin, and he is, um, he is a biologist working on conservation of especially mountain habitats in Central Asia, Yungao, uh, using design and, and uh, um, urban studies, uh, myself, I'm a sinologist and I work on sustainability transformations. Then there is Stefan Gruber, who is just standing next to me and he is uh, a lawyer working on the uh, environmental and cultural protection issues. Uh, Shekhar Kolipaka, who is an uh, anthropologist working on, on animal human beings interaction in India, especially interaction and with tigers. Um, and then Nicholas Temple, who is on the far right here, and he's a, a historian of human development. So we were all people with very different uh, backgrounds from disciplinary point of view and also in terms of our legacy and our history as practitioners. Uh, I forgot to mention at the beginning, I, before entering academia I was in development cooperation, I worked a few years for Minister of Foreign Affairs of Italy. So also in terms of practitioners, uh, we were different people, different bunch of people. And the reason why we went to the forest were very much similar to the one I was mentioning to you uh, before. So a sense of fear and urgency to cope with this um, impacts, social ecological impacts of the Better Road Initiative, some of which can be foreseen, some others not. And this idea that for, for us, for all of us, this group of people, uh, it was a window of opportunity to reflect very deeply about development and, and civilizational issue. And the intention and the objective was to try to reframe visions of the Belt and Road Initiative as well as to uncover new intentions for our, our own research. We employed the review process And our target was to get to a stage in which we developed a new vision, as I was just mentioning, of the Belt and Road, so to reframe the vision of the Belt and Road Initiative, and also uncover, uncover our long-term intentions as researchers. So basically our process ended over there. 
we started by trying to project scenarios, socio-ecological scenarios along the Belt and Road based on the evidence we had available. So there was a first session which was very much about data and then, you know, very much heavy stuff and input. And then to project scenarios, we used one a technique which is called headlines from the future. So we, pretend, we pretended we were journalists writing from the Silk Road Daily in 2039. And each of us has to deal with a specific aspect on the Belt and Road Initiative with which we were most familiar with. And this was an exercise to some extent of storytelling. Of course we use data, some of us use data, and so you see here some examples. So those were the materials that we were uh, preparing each of us and then discussing together. Um, so each of us uh, did this from uh, his or her own um, um, field of scholarship. Then there was a phase in which we were approaching the bottom of the U, in which we sort of let go, let go all this, uh, you know, download all this amount of information we got from each other. These we were just standing on the fire in the night, but you know, the the the, the place where we tried to do the shift, the mind shift, was was actually in the forest. So after we did all this very heavy part in projecting scenarios based on our scholarship, data available and so on, uh, in this phase we went for a meditation walk in the forest, alone, in which we are also required to start and feeling and embodying different entities, not only uh, human beings, but also trees, animals in the forest, and so on and so forth. This is a very important uh, exercise for two reasons. First one, you get different time perspective, which is much longer than human beings, especially if you think yourself as a tree, which has a much longer time span, lifespan than a human beings, and so this is very important for sustainability, uh, because it is about long-term trends. Uh, it, it also allows you to take different perspectives from different living entities, which is also very important to approach in transformative ways sustainability. And upon coming back from the meditation, we use this as an instrument to project not uh, scenarios, but a new vision. So we did again the headlines from the future exercise, but this time the time horizon was much longer, so 2069 instead of 2039, and uh, each of us embodied different entities. So somebody was an antelope, somebody was a frog, and so on and so forth. I know it sounds like crazy hippie stuff, but the results were, I, I trust very much this process, and the results were uh, extremely satisfying to me. Let's see if, uh, I think I have it later. Sorry, because I don't want to spoil it. Uh, I will, I, we weren't able to, I <coughs> will check it here. Yes, I have it wrong. So, um, in this way we got a completely different vision of the Belt and Road Initiative. And there was a lot about uh, coexistence, of course, of different living entities. The pro-development bias, which was dominated our real scenarios, was gone. It was not there anymore. There was, of course, some of, some of us <coughs> were still embodying the human being. I was a human being, for example, I was the only one. So some of us were still trying to see this from a uh, human-based approach, so there was a little bit of development, but it was more about happiness rather than material growth. So it was a complete change of, of, of perspective on the Belt and Road Initiative. We then took out the values which, are, which were emerging from these new headlines and put on a vision tree. So we tried to organize them on different levels, values and practices. And there were a lot of uh, very deep um, and very meaningful, I think, uh, values and approaches to life and to relationship with nature as well. Uh, caring was there a lot. Compassion also was really much in, in each of our stories. Uh, patience, the capacity to adapt, and so on and so forth. So it was a very rich harvest of values. Extremely rich. And I was very surprised by this, um, to be honest, even though I trust the process. 
so it was uh, technology was there also uh, a little bit, but it was uh, very much about uh, very core values. The final stage of the of the retreat was to take these values and to put into a declaration. We had very big fights, no, not very big fights, but we had a lot of discussion about this, also because each of us came from different perspectives. Because when then you have to put values in a declaration, other aspects of your background comes up. Comes up. Some of us were atheists, some of us were, were uh, Christians, and, and so on and so forth. So also the, religional, uh, the religion aspects came, and our legacies um, came when we were discussing how to put down things. But then we managed. You can find this on, on Zenodo, so it is, this is a, an open access, so you can just find online. Um, but then we found a synthesis, in a way. And these are the core uh, uh, messages, well, the core, uh, well, this is the declaration, basically, in its current form. We are, we are just keep working on this. Um, so it will be modified, but this is uh, as it is now. And I think there are three different things uh, which we stand for. The one which is very strong is this sense of belonging to complex living communities along the Belt and Road Initiative. And we all felt part of this. The idea that biological and cultural diversity has an intrinsic value to them, which cannot be monetized. The need for finding pathways of action to protect this diversity in ways which are caring uh, and, and compassionate. And then the idea that it's very important to do this to try to realign these ethical stances with scientific knowledge, which is very much important. And this, the last part of the declaration, is as, most, uh, as much to do with our work as scholars of this you know, group of people who went to the forest. If we have to look at the process we went through in the forest, based on the same matrix I was showing to you at the beginning, what we saw and we could observe was when we got to the forest and we tried to project scenarios from the Belt and Road Initiative based on available evidence, it was pretty much there. So uh, it was... Uh, framed as, uh, you know, trying to you know, very much in line with, with mainstream practices of development, I would say. There is, a, there is some sustainability in it, there is some concern for the environment and, and communities and so on, but it's very mainstream in terms of its uh, approach to development. When we try to reach down to our values and to project them, well, we basically we got up there. So all the values and the visions we were trying to um, uh, project into the future, we are very close to those things, ecofeminism to some extent, indigenous movements, and so on and so forth. So, as I was saying, intrinsic value to nature and to cultural diversity, and not really much concern about material growth, per se. And now the next, the next step is to move uh, the entire process from this part, so trying to crystallize values and visions to something more substantial. And that's a tricky part. That's why very, always, very often in the book you find very powerful, destructive parts in which with the criticism of society and the way it works, but then when you get, okay, so what do we do now? That's much more difficult. So this is what we are struggling with uh, right now in, uh, in Venice and we are working on two different ways. Uh, in terms of research, um, and we are just discussing also these days the possibility to fund this in Venice. Um, what we have been discussing with this group of people is to try to map so, uh, transformative practice, practices along the Belt and Road corridors. Uh, when I mention Belt and Road corridors, I don't mean necessarily the infrastructural corridors, but the places where these corridors crosses important areas in terms of biological diversity and cultural diversity, which are hotspots, uh, in a way, along the Belt and Road of these two things. So uh, those places are very important to us. So this is something we are exploring in different fields. It can be uh, management of natural resources, 
traditional husbandry to ecotourism, uh, whatever. And of course, the network of, pe the network of people we work with would allow to do that because you have people working in different areas on different sectors and practitioners as, practitioners as well. The second uh, field we are exploring um, is to work even more on the role of culture uh, in sustainability transformations. And on this, there is already a substantial, well, it's, it's going to be substantial next year and concluded next year. So we are launching a, a master degree in environmental humanities, which is coordinated by the Center of Social Change in the university and based in, the, in my department, basically in the Department of Asian and North African Studies. So the important thing for, uh, for us, and which relates a lot to what we've been talking about today, um, is that while when you are working on environmental humanities, you are allowed to unearth the potential of you know, different place-based approaches uh, to socio-ecological relations in, in dealing with those civilizational challenges I was uh, uh, mentioned before. And area studies is very much important in this. Ethnic studies is, is one of the very important stuff in this anthropology, you know. So this is something we really much uh, look forward to as a very important thing uh, to work in this direction. I think my time is, is almost up. So I think I, I would just uh, end here and then leave you know, the floor for, for, the, for comments.